Okay, thank you, Kitty. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Cesar Rodriguez Serona, whom I've known for a number of years uh, professionally. And uh, Cesar got his start in um, with his bachelor's degree at Univers Universidad Nacional Agraria in Lima, Peru. Uh, his master's degree in 1994 from Oregon State University. And his PhD at one of my old stomping grounds at the University of California, Riverside, with uh, his major advisor was John Trumbull. Now, it's kind of strange how Cesar has uh, followed me in where I have worked from one step to another. Cesar then did do two postdocs. One was um, at, uh, here we go, it was uh, University of Toronto, and then he followed up with a postdoc at Michigan State University. I'm very interested in what Cesar does because his second postdoc was uh, at Michigan State University, working with a lot of people that I had worked with, including Dr. Jim Miller, who he and I worked together on the push-pull strategy of, of managing insect pests and manipulating pest behavior through an understanding of the of pest uh, um, responses to uh, allele chemicals and repellents and deterrents and such. And uh, Cesar has a strong background in chemical ecology, tritrophic interactions, and insect ecology in general. So I'm, I'm all ears and want to hear what he would like to share with us today. So take it away, Cesar. Thank you, Rich. And uh, thank you, Kitty, for both of you for the invitation to give this, uh, this seminar. Um, so um, I will uh, summarize in... Uh, less than an hour, um, 20 years of research uh, to on, on work that I have been doing to manipulate natural enemy behavior in agroecosystems and with the hopes to improve conservation biological control. So um, Rich already gave a brief background of uh, my career path, uh, but I wanted to give also some a summarize, you know, my, my, my career um, to start my talk. Um, so I started my journey in entomology as an undergrad student in biology at the Universidad Nacional Agraria in Lima, Peru, um, where I worked on parasitism of a newly invasive pest at the time, the white flight uh, Bemisia tabasi in sweet potato. After I completed uh, my bachelor's degree, I moved to Oregon State, uh, to Oregon uh, for my master's in entomology at Oregon State University, where I worked on improving uh, biological control uh, through selection um, of predators, uh, lady beetles, for short development times. And then I went to UC Riverside to complete my PhD, uh, where I worked on the roles of specialized defensive cells in avocados against uh, insect herbivores. I did a, a, a postdoc at the USDA ARS lab in uh, at the time was in, in Phoenix, Arizona, in Tempe, and now it's in uh, uh, Maricopa uh, at the what was used to be the Cotton Research Lab. And uh, there I, um, I learned how to collect uh, plant volatiles and I studied their role in cotton, ligus, natural enemy interactions. Uh, but I wanted to test uh, these tritrophic level interactions in the field, so I moved to, um, to Toronto uh, where I worked at the University of Toronto under um, the supervision of Jennifer Taylor, who's now at Cornell. And before I joined Rockers, I did a, a, a brief postdoc, less than a year, at Michigan State University, where I uh, looked at the role of plant volatiles to attract um, the, uh, the, by then, was a newly invasive pest, uh, the emerald ash borer. Um, at Rockers, I'm the blueberry and cranberry entomologist. Uh, since uh, joining Rockers, uh, my program has asked uh, both basic and applied questions. On the basic side, uh, we have been asking, does domestication affect plant defenses against herbivores? 
And uh, does a pathogen infection affect plant insect interactions? And on the more applied side, we have been asking, can we use um, semiochemicals to manipulate insect behavior and reduce pest populations? So we are testing attractants and repellents, and this is some of the, the work I have been um, uh, collaborating with, uh, with Rich on looking at attractants. Uh, we looked at attractants for spiderwing drosophila, but also uh, we want to use uh, these um, attractants and repellents to develop strategies to manipulate insect behavior for the control um, in mating disruption, uh, attract and kill, and push-pull strategies, as uh, Rich mentioned. But today I'm going to talk about the work that I have been doing on natural enemy attractants and food sources uh, for natural enemies to conserve biological control. This is uh, an area that I have been very passionate about in the past uh, 20 years. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I work on tritrophic interactions. So these are interactions among plants, the herbivores that feed on the plants, and the natural enemies uh, of these herbivores. So early on, researchers in host plant resistance have studied the influence of plants, plant defenses on herbivores, while researchers in biological control study the impact of the natural enemies on the herbivores. But these uh, two methods of control were viewed as independent strategies. So it wasn't until 40 years ago when Peter Price and colleagues uh, wrote a seminal paper arguing that theory on insect plant interactions cannot progress realistically without considering the third trophic levels. So since then, there have been several studies on tritrophic interactions. However, most of these stu studies used a single plant species, a single herbivore species, and also a single species of the natural enemies. So early in my career, I asked whether these studies were realistic. Also, I have been asking, uh, what are the ecological factors that influence these uh, interactions? More recently, if these interactions can be exploited to enhance biological control. So to start with this seminar, I'm going to give you a brief review of plant defenses, a very basic review on plant defenses. As you know, uh, plants cannot run away from their enemies, but instead employ several strategies to reduce the number of herbivores and feeding damage on plants. Uh, plants are known to produce toxins, anti-feeding compounds, and also growth inhibitory compounds, some of which are stored in specialized structures, such as trichomes, for example, in tomato plants. And these compounds are known to reduce the growth and also decrease the feeding of the herbivores on those plants. In addition, plants produce volatiles that attract the natural enemies of those herbivores. These volatiles may provide an indirect protection to those plants that emit them when the plants are present, when, when the natural enemies are present. So defenses in plants against herbivores can be induced after herbivore feeding damage. And one such type of inducible defense are proteinase inhibitors. And as the name indicates, uh, these, um, uh, these are compounds that inhibit the enzymes that break down proteins, thus affecting the insect digestion. For example, I found that the activity of proteinase inhibitors increases more than three times when tomato plants are damaged by caterpillars. And an increase in these proteinase inhibitors uh, activity uh, is correlated with a decrease in the performance of the caterpillars on these plants. But not all her herbivores induce the same responses in tomatoes. For instance, when um, tomatoes are attacked by sucking herbivores like aphids, um, it does not cause a change in proteinase inhibitor activity. Instead, feeding by potato aphids in on tomatoes increases caterpillar performance on, on plants, indicating that aphids, aphid feeding induces susceptibility of tomatoes to these caterpillars. So as I mentioned, in addition to um, uh, caterpillar feeding, uh, uh, plants produce volatiles, and in addition to uh, direct defenses, um, plants also uh, induce the production, the emission of volatiles, when they are under attack by a herbivore. 
For example, similar to other studies, I showed that Caterpillar induces volatile production in cotton plants. And this graph shows the emissions of cotton plants damaged by Spodoptera exigua larvae and endamaged plants. As you can see, more volatiles are emitted when uh, plants are damaged by the caterpillars. But early on, I uh, wanted to see how specific this response was. So I tested whether this uh, volatile response in plants was a specific depending on the type of herbivore feeding habit um, that you have on the plant. For this, I compared the volatile emissions from cotton plants when damaged by a chewing caterpillar, the Spodoptera exigua, a cell content feeder like a Cesperus, and a flowing feeder like um, uh, this, this white fly, Bemisia tabasi. So the first two ca can cause great amount of damage to the plant, while the uh, third uh, herbivore, the flowing feeder, is more, more, more gentle and cause less uh, mechanical damage. Although, as we know, uh, uh, a lot of these sucking insects can transmit diseases to plants. So I found that the amount of volatiles emitted from cotton, cotton plants varies depending on the type of herbivore feeding. A chewing and cell contact uh, feeders induce high emissions of volatiles from these plants. In contrast, uh, the more gentle flowing feeder induce less amount of volatiles. So this is important because plants are often damaged by multiple herbivores. And how, uh, how plants respond to multiple herbivory may differ to when they are damaged by a single herbivore. For example, I found that volatile emissions in cotton are reduced when damaged simultaneously by caterpillars and, and white flies, compared to when they are damaged just by the caterpillars. And at least three of these compounds were reduced by multiple herbivory. And this specificity is likely due to the fact that caterpillars and aphids and other sucking insects induce different types of uh, defenses in plants. And, that, um, and these um, defenses, uh, defense pathways induced by caterpillars and aphids um, are often conflicting. On one hand, caterpillars induce the jasmonic acid pathway that triggers induction of defenses such as proteinase inhibitors and volatiles. And on the other hand, aphids uh, activate and white flies activate the salicylic acid dependent pathway. And the activation of this uh, pathway can inhibit, interfere with the jasmonic acid pathway. So my studies were the first to document that multiple herbivory can influence volatile emissions in plants. I also showed in subsequent uh, studies that the number and identity of herbivore species on plants can influence these trichotrophic level interactions. I also conducted a study that, studies that showed that the phenotype of the neighboring plant, whether a neighboring plant is induced or not, can, affect, uh, can have an effect on the number of herbivores and natural enemies on those plants. So if you have, for example, an induced plant next to a, a, another neighbor, the number of uh, herbivores and natural enemies on those plants can vary. So this brings me to my more recent uh, research to manipulate natural enemies in agroecosystems using plant volatiles. Uh, due to increasing regulatory restrictions on chemical control, there is increasing in interest in ecologically based strategies to manage insect pests. And it is well known that uh, crop diversity can promote biological control in agroecosystems by providing food and shelter to natural enemies. But this can uh, be dependent on the composition of the surrounding landscape. Thus, increasing in diversity, uh, not just within the crop, but around the, the uh, not within the field, but around the fields, can increase ecosystem services provided by natural enemies. An expectation, though, is that these natural enemies will move from these surrounded habitats to the focal crop to reduce a pest populations. However, this might not be the case. And to assist with this process, synthetic volatiles, uh, like here in red, 
can be deployed uh, within the crop to attract these natural enemies and pull them to, uh, uh, to, uh, from these natural and semi-natural habitats. So for this, my lab has been studying whether uh, we can manipulate natural enemy behavior using these plant volatiles in agroecosystems. So that leads me to act one of my talk. So as I mentioned previously, plants increase volatile production and emissions after herbivory. And this response has been referred to as herbivore-induced plant volatiles or HIPVs. And these HIPVs play an important role in attracting natural enemies such as predators and parasitoids to their host and prey or prey. And these HIPVs are important in attracting natural enemies in nature. For example, in a trichrophic interaction consisting of wild tobacco, tobacco hornworm, and big eye, eye bugs, uh, Kessler and Baldwin found lower larval uh, survival when plants were treated with methyl jasmonate, a volatile derivative of jasmonic acid, or the HIPVs uh, hex, uh, uh, 6 hexanol, linalol, and bergamotine. However, an open question remains whether these HIPVs can be used to attract natural enemies to enhance biological control in agroecosystems. So for this to happen, three criteria must be met. First, the HIPVs must attract the natural enemies. Second, this attraction should reduce pest populations, should lead to a reduction in, in the number of herbivores on the plants. And third, this reduction in pest population should result in a reduction in crop damage and also increase in crop yield. So in a survey, in all published data uh, that have tested these HIPVs in uh, field studies, we found that several studies have supported our first criteria. There's over 40 studies that have looked into this. However, out of all of them, only a third of them, about a third of them, uh, have addressed the second criteria of whether this can lead to a reduction in pest population. And much fewer, only three of them, have addressed the third criteria, whether this can lead to benefit the plant, whether you can reduce damage or increase yield. One HIPV that has received great attention in these studies is methyl salicylate. Uh, methyl salicylate is em emitted by uh, leaves from the leaves and flowers of many plant species. Um, it is also commonly induced by feeding of uh, herb by herb by insects with different feeding habits, such as spider mites, aphids, Colorado potato beetle. And uh, this, um, this compound can serve as signal in plant-plant communication, uh, thus inducing volatile emissions from neighboring plants. More importantly, uh, it is commercially available as a slow-release dispenser called Predalure to attract natural enemies. So growers can buy this product and use it in their farms. In collaboration with Ian Kaplan from Purdue University, uh, we conducted a meta-analysis to evaluate the magnitude of natural enemy response to methyl salicylate in the field. Uh, we collected 18 experiments in 14 publications uh, that yielded um, 91 observations. And what we found was that in general, natural enemies are attracted to methyl salicylate. And we did not find any differences in the attraction between predators and parasitoids, parasitic wasps, or uh, any differences within uh, in, the, in the response to methyl salicylate across different natural enemy taxa. So in an early study, we found that lady beetles, lace wings, and surfeits are attracted to predator. But this early study was done for a short period of time. So to address my three criteria, we asked, do HIPVs provide season-long, long-term predator attraction? My criteria number one. Um, criteria number two, does HIPVs increase ecosystem function? And the third question, does HIPVs increase ecosystem services? Our criteria number three. 
So to address the first criteria, uh, we tested if the attraction of natural enemies to Predalure was reliable of, over time. For this, we conducted a study in cranberries where we had a sticky cards that were either baited with a Predalure or unbaited within the same bed. And then we counted the number of predators that were trapped on these uh, sticky cards uh, throughout the season and for two years, two consecutive years. So what we found was that uh, surfeits are highly attracted to Predalure, especially during bloom, and that this attraction was consistent uh, over the two years of this study. We also found that lady beetles were attracted to Predalure, um, but the attraction was only seen, uh, was only significant in one of the sampling dates in the first year. And this response was not consistent over the two years. And uh, these inconsistencies could be due to the, the fact that there were differences in the species composition of lady beetles between these two years. So these results indicate that we can attract uh, predators in cranberries using HIPVs. However, is it, it is important also to know what we, whether this attraction would lead to increases in predation, our second criteria. So to address this, uh, we conducted a study where we placed sentinel egg masses of the European corn borer uh, near Predalure uh, baits. So we had uh, stations with the Predalure where we placed these egg masses around it, or we had uh, stations that had no Predalure, only the, the sentinel eggs. So we left those eggs for one to two days in the field and then uh, collected them, brought them to the lab and counted the number of eggs remaining. And this was done several times over the season and was repeated in for two years. So in the first year, we found a higher predation of eggs that were near the Predalure, especially at the end of the season. And this pattern continued the following year. So on average, percent predation in the first year was about 3% higher when those eggs were near the Predalure. And this difference increased to 7% in our second year. But to, to also observe who was responsible for these differences in predation, we set up cameras in cranberry beds where we recorded the predators that were visiting these sentinel egg masses near the predators. Um, and also we had these cameras uh, looking at uh, stations without the predator. So we did the recordings for two days, two, two consecutive days, and uh, we did it eight times uh, eight different times from May through August for a total of 576 hours. So you can see here in this picture how the, the, the setup with the camera facing the Predalure and the Sentinel egg mass. You can see the Predalure there and the egg mass. So we recorded a total of 75 Predator visits and 50 52% uh, of those were by lady beetles. And the majority of these visits, 72%, were to eggs that were near the predators. As you can see here in a video showing how you can see a lady beetle visiting one, some of these egg masses. And this translated into higher predation, as you would expect. So uh, we found that eggs that were near the predator had twice the amount of predation compared to those eggs that were not near the predator. But a less studied question, as I mentioned, is whether this, the use of these HIPVs will benefit the crop by reducing damage or increasing its yield, our criteria number three. A concern raised by Ian Kaplan and others uh, with the use of these HIPVs is the potential attraction of natural enemies to areas where the prey or the host are absent, which could lead to a disruption in biological control. So a strategy that could prevent um, 
or ameliorate these uh, negative effects is by combining HIPVs with companion plants in an attract and reward scenario, where you have, as you can see here in this drawing, HIPVs here that attract the natural enemies to the crop and the companion plants here that uh, serve, as, um, serve as a reward by providing supplemental food in the form of pollen, nectar, or alternative prey. So in this case, for example, they tested buckwheat and other floral supplements. So we tested this concept in a system that consisted of bean plants as our focal plant, coriander as our companion plant, and methyl salicylate as our HIPV. We then measure the attraction of uh, natural enemies, the effects on the herbivores, and also the effects uh, on a crop damage and yield. Thus, we tested whether this attract and reward scenario uh, changes ecosystem structure, um, has an effect on ecosystem function, in, or in, an increase in ecosystem function, and also whether it provides an ecosystem service to the crop. So these studies were done by a former PhD student, Giordano Salamanca in Brazil, where he created seven replicated blocks of bean plants, and the study was repeated for two days. So in each block, he had four treatments. One of the treatments was the control with no coriander or methyl salicylate, one with the coriander only, one with the methyl salicylate only, and one with both methyl salicylate and coriander. This was our attract and reward plot. So for each treatment and, and block, he measured visually the number of predators on those bean plants. So he did like regular visits throughout the season uh, in these plots and looked and counted the number of predators visiting these, these blocks. So he found greater number of lady beetles in beans with the coriander, as you can see here, um, than the other treatments. We also found more surfaces in all our manipulative treatments compared to the control. Uh, and there was an additive effect of coriander and mesa on surfaces. Predatory sting bugs were also higher in all manipulative treatments, and there was no effect among them, as you can see here. So all increased the numbers of uh, predatory sting bugs compared to the control. He also measured visually the number of herbivores on plants, as well as the level of predation using these uh, sentinel frozen aphids that were glued to a cardboard and placed on each of the blocks. So he found a lower, a lower number of spider mites in all manipulative treatments. So there was a reduction of herb herbivores, but uh, there was no effect on herbivorous pentatomids and no effects on uh, chrysomelids. There was, however, uh, also an effect on a predation rate. Um, we found higher predation rate on our attract and reward uh, plots compared to the control. But again, what we were mostly interested in was the effect on the crop. Um, so for this, he uh, measured crop damage by visually inspecting the leaves of the, the plants uh, per plot. And also he collected uh, the plant material to measure crop biomass per plot. So he uh, collected this uh, material to count the number and mass of the pods per plant, also the number and mass of the seeds per pod, and also he dried the, the plants to obtain uh, the crop biomass. So he found a lower damage in leaves of all the manipulative treatments due to lower spider mite population. However, this is not translate to higher crop biomass. Also, he found no effects on the number of pods or seeds or on their weights. So in conclusion, uh, we showed 
uh, support for our first criteria since HIPV is enhanced ecosystem structure by attracting natural enemies, either alone or also in combination with companion plants. Our uh, results also provide uh, support for criteria number two, that uh, we can increase ecosystem function by attracting these uh, uh, predators to, um, to these HIPVs. However, uh, our data uh, only partially supported our criteria number three, since uh, these HIPVs alone or in combination with companion plants uh, reduce herbivore damage, but did not have an effect on crop yield. So it is becoming clear that if we want to use these HIPVs to attract natural enemies, we need to find methods to provide these natural enemies with food resources in cases that, that the prey and the host are absent. So this leads me to act number two of this talk. So companion plants can provide supplementary food sources for natural enemies such as pollen, extrafloral nectar, and floral nectar. In addition, uh, plants produce droplets known as cutation, and these secretions are uh, produced along the edges, as you can see here, of the, the leaves, and uh, mainly, and in previous studies, they were mainly considered as a water source for insects. You can see here a close-up of these cutation droplets. However, um, these are fluids, not just for the, from the xylem, but also from the phloem sap that could also be composed of more than just water. So we conducted the studies to answer the following questions. When is uh, glutation present and in what quantity? Who are the insects that are visiting the glutation droplets? And does glutation increase insect fitness? Uh, these studies were done by my postdoc, Pablo Urbaneja Bernat. And uh, to answer the first question, Pablo marked randomly uh, bushes, blueberry bushes, in two fields at our center and monitored the amount of glutation production for 12 weeks and throughout the entire the day. So he had 12 weeks from bloom until post harvest and also daily look, uh, looking at the meat. Uh, the morning, midday, and evening. So he labeled four branches per bush, two that were at the top of the bush, and two at the bottom of the bush. And for each branch, he collected, uh, he selected five leaves and counted the number of leaves with gutation, and also the number of droplets per leaf. Uh, he also counted the number of insects that were visiting these droplets in the field. So this, um, this graph shows the number of uh, leaves with gutation throughout the season at the different times of the day. And we found that uh, the gutation droplets were present throughout the season, which was great because it provides a season-long uh, food source for insects and were higher um, during the, the time of active uh, plant growth. So as you can see here, the peak production is during shoot expansion and also were higher at midday. You can see here. The number of glutation drops per leaf also um, were consistent, but vary from one to three uh, per leaf throughout the season, and their production uh, tended to decline at the, um, at the end of the season. So as the leaves harden, the number of uh, droplets that you see are much fewer. This number did not change uh, during the day. So these are the insect taxa that were observed visiting these glutation drops. In a total, we found over 12 taxa that were visiting the droplets. And three major groups were flies in the family Drosophilidae, um, uh, predators in the family Chrysopidae, uh, and parasitoids. 
So for this reason, we conducted a studies to determine if mutation droplets increase the fitness of these insect groups. So we tested this on a herbivore, a parasitoid, and a predator. So the herbivore was Drosophila suzukii, the parasitoid was Aphidius ervii, and the predator Chrysoperla rufilabris. So we first uh, assessed the effects of cutation on adult longevity. And for this, we used uh, newly emerged adults. And we fed them with five different diets, consisting to on just water, mutation only, sucrose, protein, and a combination of sucrose and protein. And these diets were placed in paraffin pieces, and they were fed uh, to the insects in uh, vials, as you can see here. So we found that female uh, flies of Drosophila suzuki live longer on the glutation, as you can see here in green, and also on the sugar diet than on any other diets. And the same uh, results were found for the males. They survive, they live longer on both glutation diet and the sugar only diet. For the parasitoid, uh, females uh, live longer in the glutation diet and also the sugar uh, diet. And this was the same for the males. The, the females of the chrysopid, the uh, chrysopid, they live longer on the glutation diet, the sugar diet in gray, and also the combined diet of sugar and protein in yellow. And this was the same for the males. Uh, we did a similar study to look at the effects of cutation on egg load. So we fed females to uh, the same five diets and uh, to obtain uh, females, we placed newly emerged uh, males and females in cages for 24 hours and then recorded the number of eggs um, after feeding of the females after feeding on each of these diets one, three, and seven days after feeding. So uh, for, for the flies, we saw a difference after one day of feeding on these diets with more eggs on the glutation, sugar, and sugar and pro protein diets. And after three days, there was more separation among the treatments with more eggs in females fed with the glutation diet. And on day seven, females fed uh, the uh, glutation and the sugar diets had more eggs. For the parasitoid, on day one again, females uh, fed glutation and sugar and protein had more eggs. Uh, this was the same on day three, as you can see here in blue and yellow as well as on day seven. And for the predator, uh, females fed glutation and sugar and protein also had more, more eggs on day one. This was the same for day three. You can see here, uh, glutation is separating from the other treatments, same as the sugar and protein. And as well as on day seven, where females had more eggs um, on the uh, on the glutation and sugar and protein diets. So in conclusion, uh, these studies are the first to report that glutation is a nutrient rich source for insects and can be reliable, uh, can be more reliable throughout the season than nectar and pollen. Uh, we found that insects from several different taxa uh, visit the glutation droplets and that insects that feed on these droplets increase their, their survival and also egg load. So to leave you with a, with a take home message from uh, this, uh, um, this talk, according to our studies and also by others, it is possible to use synthetic HIPVs to manipulate natural enemies in agroecosystems but they are unlikely to work as a standalone strategy. Additional strategies will likely be needed 
in combination with these HIPVs to conserve natural enemies and enhance biological control, such as by providing food sources with the use of companion plants in an attract and reward scenario. And these plants can be rich, these companion plants can be rich in pollen, nectar, but also in gutation. So we need more research to address the question of whether multiple tactics are better than one in manipulating natural enemy behavior. Uh, this year, um, we will start a, an experiment to also look at how landscape features can influence these strike traffic interactions and the, the, uh, the attraction of these uh, predators to, the, to these HIPVs. And the, the ultimate question, and this is something that I'm sure like you're thinking about, um, is ultimately whether the, the farmers will likely be willing to adopt some of any of these strategies to manipulate natural enemies. So one of my uh, main career goals has been to train young professionals and inspire them to pursue their career dreams. And I want to thank all of my Blue Cran Ant lab members throughout these years, uh, the students, postdocs and technicians that have helped me throughout these um, years at Rockers. And if you want more information about my program, please visit my website. And thank you all for coming to my talk and listening to this presentation. So with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you so much, Cesar. That's a very um, a wonderful and very informative talk. So at the moment, we have one question in the chat section from Kim. Uh, she asks, how did you feed insect on cartesian doublets? So what we did is um, we used a paraffin and gently, uh, the, the gutation droplets are fairly thick. Um, so what we uh, did was just gently uh, push the gutation droplet to fall on the paraffin. And then we store the, para the, the paraffin with the gutation drop in, um, in, the, in the fridge. And then we, we could provide the insect with uh, every day um, with a drop, uh, a droplet, so we could um, monitor their survival and also egg, egg load. So that's how we um, we did it. Um, that's how we collected the the gutation droplets. All right, that's so good. And another question from also from Kim. She asked, "How do the volatiles you tested affect pollinators?" So that's something that um, I have been very interested to. Um, uh, uh, blueberries and cranberries rely on pollinators, uh, honeybees for uh, pollination to get a good crop. So we did a study actually uh, with um, Rufus Isaacs um, on how um, uh, honeybee visitation affected volatile emissions and how it affected future visitation by honeybees. So. If you want more information, that's a, a paper that we published a few years back. But basically what we found is that um, volatiles are very important for, for, for bees uh, in the blueberry system. And, um, and once the flower is visited, uh, the amount of volatiles is reduced. And uh, the, the, uh, it reduces the, the number of um, uh, bees that are visiting that same flower again. So it's kind of like a way to um, to distribute um, the, the the bees so they can, they don't visit the same flowers over and over and they visit other flowers. So to increase the the the, the, the visitation to other flowers that have not been pollinated. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, look like there is no question in the chat uh, in the chat Ooh, section. I've, I've got another oh, go, one. <laughs> okay, go, I'm sorry, go this ahead. Is Rich Coles. <laughs> And, okay, and okay. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't find any chat box because I think I'm a, a co-moderator or something. But um, Girolami et al. in Italy some years ago discovered that gutation fluid from uh, newly germinating corn seeds that had been treated with uh, imidacloprid or other neonicotinoids could be a potential source of um, uh, poisoning for foraging honeybees. 
And I'm concerned, I'm, I'm really wondering, you know, in blueberries, the use of the midocloprid is so important for control of oriental, or used to be important for control of oriental beetle. Perhaps they're using mating disruption now. Uh, have you <laughs> attempted to determine whether there is um, systemic insecticides being presented in the gutation fluid on blueberries and whether this might be causing interruption of biological control by these visiting natural enemies. Um, Rich, you are like describing our plan. So, um, <laughs> um, so we were going to do this this work last year, exactly what you're describing uh, last year. Um, but uh, because of COVID, my postdoc is in Spain and was not able to come back. So we are still like trying to get him a visa. So we're hoping that we can do this this year. So you're right. Uh, most of the work on the effects on insects of uh, gutation on insects has been on the these non-target effects of uh, insecticides accumulating in the gutation and them, you know, uh, especially pollinators feeding on that gutation. There's only one study that we could find that looked at um, a predator. Uh, I think it was Aureus, um, where they also look at those effects, um, these negative effects. Um, so there's no much on, on natural enemies uh, with that respect. Uh, so that's one thing that we wanted to do. And we wanted to tie it with, uh, of course, the spotted wind drosophila. And um, there's a new uh, parasitoid that we're hoping to introduce. So we wanted to look at Ganaspis brasiliensis. Um, and so the effects of, you're right, um, uh, blueberry growers use neonicotinoids for two purposes. Uh, for oriental beetle control. So they do soil trenches, like they, they apply to the soil to control the grubs, and also for aphids. Uh, so they do foliar applications to control aphids. So we were going to test both. We were going to test soil drench and foliar applications to see whether the impact is different. Again, uh, we are um, we were not able to do that. Um, if if it might help you, uh, one of my observations from having a Christmas tree farm uh, is that I've been noticing that the biological control of armored scales in Christmas tree plantations uh, seems to be disrupted by the use of uh, dinotafuran, even when applied simply as a basal bark spray. And it had occurred to me that expression of, or exposure to dinotafuran either from host feeding by parasitoids and secondary poisoning to uh, through armored scales, which aren't particularly sensitive to, you know, to midocloprid at least, um, could be could be one route of exposure. But exposure through gutation droplets could be another. A very strange phenomenon is that for white spruce, they are very attractive early in the season to uh, carpenter ants, and I suspect that there are. Um, extra floral nectaries or something like extra floral nectaries in in spruce of several species. And so, you know, there is at least a possibility that there could be uh, exposure through systemics in, in that manner. Anyway, I wanted to alert you to that this is something that I'm intensely interested in because yeah. I'd love to see biological control of these armored scales. Yeah, the, the idea that we um, that we have is to learn more about you know how what factors are contributing to the quality of the gutation. Um, so what uh, can we manipulate the quality, or are different plants species produce different quality of gutation? It seems based on the literature that it does. So gutation is mainly uh, carbohydrates. So they they um, the insects are getting like a, this big sugar, like very concentrated, it's like candy for them. So they are getting like this very concentrated amount of sugar. And, but also it has protein uh, in very small quantities. And it seems like based on our work that that protein matters for egg production, which makes sense. 
So, um, so, um, so they are getting like a source of fuel and also a source of, um, you know, uh, protein. Um, so, um, so the question is, does it vary across plants? And does it, um, does it, uh, can we manipulate, you know, how can we make it better? Um, and, and as you say, you know, can we prevent these uh, non-target effects of uh, insecticides for conservation? Is it known what ha is is it known what happens to gutation droplets? I mean, they're there, and then you look later, and they might disappear. Are they resorbed back into the foliage, or or do they dry up on the outside of the foliage? Or? Rich, you are asking like the same questions that I have been asking. So we wanted to. Like, <laughs> I told Pablo that we need to have a camera and record what happens to the droplet. Uh, the drop is very thick, so I don't know if, uh, and there's no way that insects are going to visit all the drops. They are mainly produced at night, so it, it's, that's what the literature says. We don't know why we see them in higher quantities at midday. It could be that some of them are dropping, I, I don't know. Um, mm. but, um, but they are usually, they are produced, it's a physiological event. It's a, it's a physiological, uh, you know, the plant is sweating, basically. So when you have high humidity, uh, there's, a, there's too much water, the plant is uh, uh, getting rid of this excess water. And by doing so, it gets rid of uh, good things like, sugars and proteins. Um, so the insects are taking advantage of this uh, because it's a food source. It's a, as you, you saw, it's a very reliable food source for them. It's, it's there all the time, you know, most of the time. So why not use it? Um, but I don't know what, why a plant will waste this resource. You know, like, does it absorb it? Maybe it does. Maybe it takes back the protein. Why, why waste, you know, protein that uh, they can use otherwise? Um, it, it's, I, I don't think they are doing it to attract natural enemies because the, the, the herbivores are using it too. <laughs> the, 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 anybody can use it. It's the same with volatiles. You know, anybody, it's information there for anybody to use. Yeah. So how you use it, you know, varies, but... Once, once the plant produces it, you know, anybody, yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Said. Um, if anyone have a question, please uh, um, raise your hand in the section on the upper right corner. Um, if not, I don't see anyone raise hand or type any question yet. Well, so, uh, Lisa, we're going to wait for a little bit. Uh, nope, no one raise hand yet. Okay, all right, thank you. Look like um, it's about time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sisa. That's a very uh, great uh, presentation. So, and, um, um, uh, uh, good to see you. Oh, hold on. Someone just uh, in the question. Oh, well, thank you so much. And um, I'm going to stop uh, recording and um, all, the, uh, all of your talk will be uploaded to our social media uh, platforms such as YouTube and uh, Facebook. Thank you. I stopped recording.